for me, my journey, my journey, my church journey, sorry about this, my, my church journey started back 18 years ago. And for me, it was very transformative time. The call of God was loud and clear to me, myself and my wife. And what we were very clear of at that moment in time was that we needed to find a church family. We went about our search and unfortunately, our first instance was not very positive. It was a bit, we were left disillusioned and disheartened. But through God's grace, we were led to Jubilee uh, Community Church in Observatory. There we found wonderful people who welcomed us in, who made us feel home. Very clearly, early on when myself and, and Natalie went to go and visit the church, we were absolutely sure that this is the place where God was calling us. We immediately immersed ourselves into the life of the church. We joined life groups. And there we also um, integrated within the church community itself. What we found was a community that was very loving, very caring, very supportive. We found a place where we could grow as Christians. Special mention must be made to people who were very formative to us back in the day. Uh, one of them is sitting here today, which is Sue McBride, and Jeremy and Michelle Hansen. These mentors were so influential in our spiritual growth. But as I stand here today reflecting on my journey, I look back and I see this is actually a testament about God's faithfulness. This is not just a story of my journey in church membership. This is a living testimony to the transformative power of God working through a community of believers to change and shape lives. That has been my experience. As I stand here today and I think back about my journey, I can't help but think about yours. What would your journey be like in the next few years? We would like to encourage you to consider Jubilee community as your home. We would, we would find encouragement, we would find discipleship, but also that you can have a shared sense of purpose and belonging. The Church of God is a place where you will be shepherded, where you will grow in discipleship, but ultimately it's a place where we can join hands with Jesus in building something truly glorious, a beacon of hope in a world that is in desperate need of the light of God. So I would like to encourage you today to, to I would like to extend the invitation. I think it is on the 5th, uh, the date's not up there, the, the 5th, 5th of March, 5th of March, confirmed. 5th of March, here at, at uh, Clough Street. We'd like you to come and take this opportunity to consider whether this church is the right fit for you. But we are confident and we hope that you will join us to embark on a journey of faith, growth, and what we can promise you is that if you join our community, it will be nothing short of life-changing. Thank you. If you've got any interest, um, please feel free at the back to talk to our welcome team. And with that, I'll call on Lex. Yeah, so there, there should be a slide. I think it was a notice as well, isn't it? So there is, a, there is a slide for this upcoming Exploring Membership, which is the 5th of March. I think Sasan's just sorting it out now. Um, so it's not too far away. But aren't you excited about Nicky Gumbel and Pippa Gumbel? If you've ever done their kind of through the Bible in a year, you will really thoroughly enjoy it, having them with us. And then Sam Albury as well, which just, we've mentioned as, as well this morning. Just a tremendous gift to us out of the blue. And wow, we're full. We need to get more air conditioning and all of that. And we know, we know, we know. We're working on it. We're working on it. We need to look at a renovation actually finishing this particular room so that we can cater for the numbers that come. We've got about, I'm told, 25% of the current auditorium is stuck behind this wall. 
um, but we want to get a whole air conditioning system in, get the wall down, and that's coming. So if you've got a spare million rand and you're wondering, what do I do with this million rand? It's such a burden. I don't know what... I don't know if it's really right for me just to be earning interest on this million rand. We've already collected about 400,000, so your million is going to take us over the line. Come on. <laughs> Did you like that? We don't do manipulation in this church. We're just like up front about it, you know. Can I give you my car keys? Um, Let's turn to John in chapter 5. I'm going to, the words will come up on the screen, but sometimes we like reading in our own versions. We've called this series Surprised by Jesus, and uh, we're going to look, as we did last week in a, in a passage in the Gospel of John, we're going to look in another passage of gospel, the Gospel of John this morning. Because John's Gospel is written with a very specific aim, to guide us towards faith in Christ. That's the destination that's his main goal. He says this at the end of his gospel. These things are written that you may believe and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so this gospel of John is full of statements and phrases and incidents that draw us towards an authentic life-giving faith in Jesus. It's in this gospel that we hear Jesus say, I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the way and the truth and the life. And to the religious leaders who are getting like, oh, I don't like it. He's just taking our authority away. He said to them, before Abraham was, I am. Which was shocking to them because he's taking to himself the Old Testament name of God. John says, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, born not of natural descent or of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us and we have beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. Even, even Jesus' miracles are referred to as signs. They are guiding you to a conclusion. They are pointing you, guiding you towards a destination. And the desired destination, the outcome of all of John's writing is that you realize who Christ is and you put your trust in him. Following him now faithfully, as I trust you are, and following him into eternity, into a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells, hallelujah. So the result of surrendering to Christ today is that you find forgiveness for all your sins. Wow. Have you surrendered to Christ? Have you really surrendered? Think of the word. Have you surrendered? Have you laid your weapons down? Have you said, okay, I can't have that sin anymore, and I can't have that sin anymore. I'm laying it down. I'm surrendering to him. Because if you do, you find forgiveness of sins, purpose in life, a father and a shepherd who will guide you and protect you and love you. You find energy and meaning in life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. Come on, Christian, this is yours. And for all of us, it's wide open for us. This is the essence that's missing in your life. Something missing in my life. This is it, I'm telling you. What's the meaning of life? I'm right now telling you, this is it. Here, we got it. We got it, we found it. Let's not become jaded or bored. What, what is this? No, we found it, we found it. This is joy. This is satisfaction. This is the completion for which the human heart hungers and longs. 
We've got it. It's Jesus. It's not like the counterfeit copies of temporary satisfaction and temporary joy that the the world offers us. Substitutes for the real thing that promise much but don't actually deliver. They're phantoms. They're fantasies only. The temporary high of drugs or drink or of sexual thrills or of financial success of promotion, advancement, respect. These things are attainable, but they are not the core of what gives you actual satisfaction. And they can vanish, vanish very suddenly. What remains? In Christ, you discover life and peace. It's like a, like a well of refreshing water springing up from within you. Hallelujah. It's like knowing the favor of God on you. It's like walking with God in the garden, just like it should be. So John is guiding us to Christ. So let's look at John 5. And in John 5, we find another surprising encounter with Jesus. This is a guy surprised by Jesus, no question. Sometime later, verse 1, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there is in Jerusalem, near the sheep gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades, rows of columns. Here, a great number of sick people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, one who was there who had been disabled for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Don't be offended if Jesus asks you a question which seems to be completely obvious to you. Because he's asking you to find out, do you really want the implications of following me? Do you want to be forgiven? Well, of course. No, it means a radical change of your whole life. You know, everything Everything changes. Everything changes for this man after this one question. Do you want to get well? Sir, the disabled man replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And then Jesus says to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, It is a Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, uh, The man who made me well, he said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea, no idea who it was. I mean, his life had just changed. He didn't have a lot of theology. No idea, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. But later, this is the key, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning. (laughs) This is a scary verse. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Well, before we get to the text, uh, we've got two points before we actually get to the text. The first question is this, is the Bible reliable? I don't know if you believe the Bible is reliable. There's There's a myth that uh, people never used to question the Bible. You know, before, before the, the modern era, before education, our modern Western education, people were just dumb. They just believed whatever was told them. They just believed the Bible. You know, C.S. Lewis calls that kind of thing chronological snobbery. From, is that the power gone? Sounds like it. From the beginning, the word of God was questioned. 
It's a myth that it was never questioned. It's always been questioned, literally from the beginning. One of the first objections we hear is, did God really say? From the beginning, the word of God has been questioned. But even in the modern era, let's say from the 1500s or so, the Bible has been at the absolute center of debates around philosophy, ethics, how society should be, how people should behave, how to get right with God. Can you even get right with God? Can you have a relationship with God? Can you get your sins forgiven? The Bible has been at the center of all those tussling debates, arguments, theories, and so on. And you might not know this, that even though the Bible has been defended by many, of course, believers, this particular passage has been criticized, has come under fire. And the Bible doesn't mind it when it's on, under the microscope. We're not, we're not afraid of the Bible being challenged. Because for centuries, there was no historical evidence at all outside of what John says here, that a pool like this ever existed in the place where he says it existed. There is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool called Bethesda with, unusually, five colonnades. That is five rows of columns around. Are we doing our own ESCOM thing here? Maybe it's us. <laughs> So there was, no one ever wrote about it. There was absolutely no evidence, no documentary evidence and no archaeological evidence for this pool where John says it was. And also, of course, as so often happens, he's just mentioning it in passing. He's not making a claim about this particular pool. He's just saying, this is where it happened. It happened there. And the text uses the present tense. Did you pick that up? There is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, which suggests that this was written, this gospel was written before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So it's very early. There is, it's still there. It's before Jerusalem was razed to the ground and you couldn't find anything. And it's called Bethesda and it's got five covered colonnades. Five, not four, which suggests it's a, a pool with an unusual design but there's no other historical evidence to this pool in this place. And the assumption by the skeptics who came at it hard was that the writer must have got it wrong. And for generations, skeptical scholars asserted that here was clear evidence of error that the, Bi the Bible has historical errors in it. Here is a, a historical error in the New Testament. And more than that, they argued that the author, therefore, could, of John's gospel could not have been John because John, who knew Jerusalem and lived in Jerusalem, would never have made a mistake, a blunder, such a silly blunder like this. This must have been written centuries later by someone who was not familiar with Jerusalem and just guessed at the location, put it in there, and wrote as though it was written before the destruction of uh, Jerusalem in AD 70, but actually was writing later. The Apostle John would never have made such a huge schoolboy error. And the weight of non-Christian scholarship, and alas, as often happens when it's, when it's given with a bit of bravado, where the academic and the scholarship comes against the Bible, you will often find Christians conceding a point here, conceding a point there. The weight of scholarship, including some Christians, asserted that the gospel must have been written, therefore, centuries afterwards by someone who was unfamiliar with Jerusalem before it was destroyed. Humble pastors just trusted the Bible. What do you do? Christians who just read their Bible said, well, I trust the Bible. And there's always, you know, but I'm just trusting that John's the author and what he said was true. And then, in the 1880s, there was a sensational claim. And the claim was, it's been found. The site by the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem included, as is often the way, churches, Byzantine and later medieval churches that are built on top of this site. 
So there were a few churches kind of on top of the rubble and then on top of each other over the centuries. And it obscured the design of the five colonnades. They couldn't find that. But they did find a pool near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem. But the archaeologist, who's a German guy called Konrad Schick, he said, I found it, but in a German accent. <laughs> I found that. I, I don't know. No, 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 I'm not going to do a German accent. He, he found it. He said, I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. He was absolutely convinced. But there was still like a question mark. Guess what? It's only in 1964. That's so late. Nearly, I mean, 2,000 years afterwards that a comprehensive excavation was carried out. Don't show the picture yet. Don't show the picture. Has she shown it already? <laughs> oh, come on. It says in the notes. Where does she? <laughs> it's my punchline gone. <laughs> just keep going. You just all, just. Anyway, it wasn't a five-sided pool like a pentagon shape, which they kind of expected. It's actually a pool with two sections or two halves with a, a row of columns in between. And they only found five bases, bases for five colonnades. So they actually found it. And those that, did you see it already? <laughs> but look how far they had to dig down. I mean, you can't even see. There's a walkway there, but that's not even ground level. So they really had to get down low. And it could be these are the actual steps. It's an amazing thing. Right. <laughs> Second point. That teaching and healing are... Orthodox in terms of the Christian religion. Supernatural healing as well as ordinary medical healing. These are orthodox, as is teaching. So teaching and healing is a massive part of Jesus' ministry. Everywhere that the Christian gospel has gone, educational institutions have sprung up. There is no history of hospitals in the Greek world or in the Roman world. You, you do have like... There's a block that was found where injured soldiers would just go, but that's not a hospital. The idea of a hospital, and definitely the idea of nursing orders and 24-hour medical care is a Christian idea, is a Christian initiative. And everywhere the gospel's gone, and of course, the, these are good things, the world picks it up, everywhere the gospel has gone, teaching and healing and teaching and healing has come, because that's what Jesus modeled to us. Let me give you a few examples of that from a couple of the Gospels. Matthew 4, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Teaching the good news of the kingdom and healing. Uh, Matthew 8, when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. Mark 1, that evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town, I mean, that was a meeting, gathered at the door. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. Matthew 9, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus moves towards them, teaches, and heals them. If there's a criticism that Jesus just healed this one man who was there when this was like a gathering point. I think we can answer either that this was a close-up, you know, which you sometimes get, you get a close-up of a particular case. But it seems to me, reading, it's more likely that he just had compassion on a man who for 38 years, he could see there's no one helping him. And he reached out to this man. You can't bring a charge against Jesus for only healing one man. He spent hours and hours healing the sick, casting out demons, teaching the people all the, through the day and long into the night. Thirdly, finally, and this is the bulk of it really, if Jesus is for him, Jesus is for you. He's for him and he's for you. Verse five, one who had been there 
had been disabled for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in that condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the disabled man replied, I have no one to help me. Now, evidently, there was a superstition about this pool that an angel would come down once a year and stir up the water, and whoever could get into the water first would be healed. Textual critics think that a later scribe put this in because that verse isn't in, it's probably not in your modern version, but it wasn't in the earlier manuscripts. It's a later edition. And so textual critics suggest that a scribe in the, put in the margin an explanation of what is this, because Josephus doesn't talk about anything like this either. So at sources outside the New Testament don't give it. And a bit like a, a preacher or a teacher giving some context, there was a belief that this would happen once a year and stir up the water. But it's clearly a superstition. It's not how God behaves. And the man believed it. Being healed, being forgiven of your sins is not like a lottery. It's not like a competition, whether it's first come, first serve. It's not that at all. Christianity is not the survival of the fittest. That's what this story illustrates. This story illustrates the opposite of that. It's not the survival of the fittest. It suggests this, that if you feel helpless, if you feel like everyone else is out for themselves, and who's looking after me? Jesus is right there. He's right there in front of you able to help. He's there for you. Also, there's, I mean, I, I'll just throw this in, but some scholars say, well, could, this could be, a, you've never heard of Asclepius because all of these fake gods are dead. And so, but there was a Greek god called Asclepius, and you know, the Romans co-opted all things Greek into their, the way they did things, architecturally and all the rest of it. And there's a, a someone suggests that at this pool, there was that superstition as well. And so it wasn't just Jewish people gathering there. It was like a kind of a place where maybe something would happen. Anyhow, Jesus goes to this place of confusion and superstition, and he feels compassion for an elderly man. And he asks him, do you want to get well? And the man says, I have no one. Have you felt like that? Have you felt things would be better if I had this one thing. If, just, if I just had this one, if this one person helped me, then everything would be okay. Or if I had this one thing, then, then my life will begin to get sorted out. If I, if I had a husband, if I had a wife, then, you know, everything would, it would all kind of flow in. If I had a job, if I, if I, if I had a car, if I, if I had if I could get a house or a flat, an apartment or something, if I had this thing, then, and if you can't get those things, if I just had an iPhone, if I had, no, did anyone ever say if I had a Samsung? Is that a bit snobbish? <laughs> That's, a bit snobbish. That's over the line, isn't it? No one ever said if I only had a Samsung. If I only had a Nokia. So, <laughs> no, sorry. You can scratch that from the recording. I'm talking about television sets, obviously. Um, if I only had this one thing, do you, you tempted to feel that? Then everything would be okay. And it's you're kind of projecting ahead. Whereas Jesus is standing in front of you right now. And he's saying, you've got me. The man says, I have no one. And Jesus is right there. I have no one. And Jesus is saying to him, you have me. I have now come. So it is for us. You know, when people need, are in pain, they need relief, they'll try anything. This guy was trying, he'll try every, anything to get healed, to get free from this, ah, whether it's mental pain, physical pain, we, we, we will try just about anything. Try Jesus. Christian. For goodness sake, I shouldn't need to say it to a Christian. You know, try Jesus. <laughs> well, I tried. Uh, but have you read the Bible through even once? Well, I tried that too. You know, what, what are you exactly are you trying? Well, I come to church once a month. You know, it doesn't seem to work. Hello? 
Jesus is standing right in front of you. We're broken and we need help. You know, it's, it's weird. Isn't it weird that we try just about any, anything apart from the one who's actually died for us, risen from the dead, ascended and saying, come. I've, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I'm, that may sound strange to you, but that's an old-fashioned phrase from the old Bible. He's got the provision. He's got it. We're broken. We're broken individually. We're broken as a people. I don't see social evolutionary progress happening anywhere. Do you? Really? Do you? Late 19th century, here comes the theory. The 20th century, there's more wars and more recorded deaths than ever in human history. I do not see social evolution in a positive direction at all. I don't see that. I don't see it. This century looks like it's going to be just as bad as the last one. Hey, whether it's Russia bombing Ukraine or what's happening in the Middle East, we feel like well, you've got to choose a side. You don't have to choose a political side. Actually, you can, but you don't have to choose a political side. Whether it's people killing young people at a music festival or families in kibbutzes is outrageous, or whether it's the relentless killing of families that's happened since then in Palestine. Well, are you, are you pro-Palestine? you pro-Israeli? No, I'm, we're pro-life. I'm pro-life. Whether it's in the womb, irrespective of the beliefs of the parents, or whether it's out of the womb, we're against the killing, aren't we? How do I pray about this? It's so complex. God, please stop the killing. Something's got to happen. Stop the killing, Lord whether it's in the Ukraine or Palestine or wherever it is in the world, we're broken. It illustrates this like it's a massive thing. It's not a small thing. It, there's a problem here. There's a problem. And there's a problem in your own heart and in my own heart as well. I don't see social evolution, but I do see what the Bible says, which is that we are sinners that man is sinful. That's what the Bible says. Ah, that makes sense of the world as I look at it. Now I, I'm on board with that. I can see that. We are sinful and we seem to be unable to overcome. We're repeating, you know, one poet, Steve Turner, said history repeats itself. Has to. Nobody listens. It just, again, and again, here we embarking on a new century, new hopes, not as strong as the beginning of the 20th century. That was off the back of huge advancements in so many different areas. And then the First World War, and then the Second World War, and then multiple wars all across the world. There's a problem. And it's no good saying, well, I'm not as bad as that person over there. I'm a bit better than that, so that's good. It's not good. We need our sin sorted out. We need radical help. Because we're helpless. <laughs> I have no one to help me, says this man. Romans 5 says, while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were helpless, like this man, Jesus came. And he didn't wait for us to climb up into heaven and find him. The basis of most religions is, you know, steps up toward enlightenment or toward... It's not that we so loved God and asked him for his only begotten son. It's that God so loved us and gave us his son. He, we love because he first loved us. And did you notice, Jesus doesn't wait for an introduction even to this man. He just goes straight to him. There's no preamble, nothing. Do you want to get well? <laughs> it's just a bang, straight in. Do you want to get well? Well, he says, I can't get well. I can't get well because there's no one, you know, this, it's not working for me. John Calvin said, this sick man does what we nearly all do. He limits God's help to his own ideas and doesn't dare promise himself more than he conceives in his own mind. 
In other words, he's thinking, if I just get this one thing, then my life will work out. Jesus interrupts his plan. He interrupts it without being invited, just like maybe you're here today. You, you know, a nice person, a friend, they're very nice. They are very nice. And they invited you. What, what a lovely thing. And here you are. And suddenly, Jesus is saying to you, your whole life, everything, the whole lot, you need to follow me. You need to follow me. Well, I, I, I think I need more of an introduction. <laughs> this is it. This is it. Well, I need a build-up, surely. I mean, that's like I need to, you know, people feel that. I need to kind of get a little better here and a little better there, and then I can kind of step into. No, no, you're a sinner. You're helpless. Well, now that's a little bit offensive. Well, it's a little bit true. <laughs> you need him. We all went through this, by the way. None of us started up there. We all, the way up is down. If you want to go up, you've got to take a step down. It's a humble, childlike thing. No, he just says, come on, do you want to get well? Well, do you? You think, well, that's, from the outside, you think, that's what, what a ridiculous question. It's so obvious that this man needs to get well. Do you know what? There's some people looking at your life saying that. It's so obvious. Why can't you see it? Why, what's going on here? What gym, mental, intellectual gymnastics are you doing to try and avoid the absolutely obvious? And Jesus gives him a command. <laughs> it just gives him a command, get up and walk. It's just a straight command, it's abrupt, it's unexpected, there's no preamble, there's no process leading up to it. He doesn't get the atmosphere right, he doesn't kind of get the band up on the stage. It's not like there aren't violins playing in the background, there's no kind of Bible study before it. He just says, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. It's clear, it's for now, it's for this moment, right now and Jesus says to you today right now repent and believe the good news repent which means turn away from what you used to believe about me and turn to me repent give up your sins and follow me and you're saying, but I don't know how this pool works and the stirring of the water. I've got to work it out. I'm a slow processor. It's, I've been struggling with this for 38 years, trying to work all this stuff out. And Jesus is standing in front of you and he's saying, you're trying to work out the wrong thing. I'm standing in front of you. You need to follow me. No, I just need to work all this. What about all this? I've got to get it all sorted. No, you don't. You're trying to work out the wrong stuff. Repent and believe the good news. And follow me, says Jesus. Just so up front. You follow me. I have come that you might have life, says Jesus, and have it to the full. I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Because that's the, the battle going on, isn't it? It's like, no. I, you know, I've got the possibility of these sins, and I've got the, this, and what about that? And what, what about my former? What about my ex? I've got all these entangled, I've got to sort it all out. Bring all of the entanglements of your life. Bring the tangled up threads of your life that you can't disengage or disentangle and you think before you could be a Christian, you've got to do all that. Just bring it all, just dump it on the table like so many electrical cables and wires and say, God, here's my life. I want to surrender to you. I want to follow you. Today is the day of salvation. Well, I, I don't know. Listen, there's a verse that Billy, Billy Graham used to quote it, he, almost every sermon. And it's one of the most frightening verses in the whole Bible. You ready? This is a scary one. I'm just putting out like a trigger warning. Proverbs 29, verse 1. He who is often rebuked 
and hardened his, hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Hello? And he used to preach that. You don't know how much longer you've got. You don't know that. It's a shock when you suddenly are facing it. This is the end. Or your family is. You know, we don't know. Get up and walk, says Jesus. This is a promise for right now. And he just obeys. <laughs> but the ligaments and the muscles won't be. He just obeys. But it's all atrophied and, you know, how can it be? He just obeys. Get up and walk. He gets up. He walks. He's miraculously healed. Just do what Jesus says. That's what we heard last Sunday, wasn't it? Uh, the turning of the water into wine, whatever he, do, whatever he tells you, do it, said Mary. You believe in Mother Mary. That's her verse for you. Just do whatever Jesus says. That's your doorway in to truth. And if you come to him, you don't just get the forgiveness of your sins. The Father loves you. And the Holy Spirit comes to you. And Jesus is yours. And he's yours and you're his. You, you get the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You get life. You get security. You get the answer. Hallelujah. I can't, I, I mean, I, I'd like to leave this verse off as well, but I can't because Jesus says to him, after he's got healed, after he's like, I'm now, this is it. I'm literally walking and following Jesus. Jesus says to him, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. There's another one of those awkward verses. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Now that doesn't mean judgment is hanging over your head, God's just waiting for that one mistake and then kajunga. He's saying, leave your life of sin. That's what he's saying. Come out of a life of sin and self-focus Turn around, turn around. You've lived a life of unbelief. I'm calling you to a life of faith. Turn around, follow me. He was surprised by Jesus, this man. Hey, what about you? You had any surprises recently with him? Let's stand together and we'll pray. Whew, hallelujah, let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful to you on a beautiful day like this that the gospel of Jesus Christ is still being proclaimed, that you are still faithfully drawing people to yourself. And I pray for us, well, let me, I'll pray for us as believers in a second, for those who know they're saved. Father, I pray for any who are here this morning who don't know you, who aren't certain. I pray, God, today they would say, yes, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. And it may be that that's you this morning, that you know today you need to follow the Lord Jesus. And you need to get up and walk, as it were, spiritually. You need to actually say, okay, I'm following him now. I've, I've, I've dabbled, but now I want it, I'm in. And if that's you, I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. If that's you, would you just lift your hand up where you are? Anyone else? Anybody saying this? One person over there. Anybody else saying this? Today, I want to follow Jesus. There's a second hand there. Wonderful. Anybody else saying, yes, Lord? I want to pray for these two. Oh, there's a third, sorry. There's a third, there's a fourth hand there. Wonderful. Wonderful. And there's one right at the back as well. I'm not tall enough. There's five of you. Lord, I pray for these five souls. In fact, let's pray with them and for them. Can I encourage you to make this your prayer? And this is simply going to be me you and me saying, I give my life to you, Lord. I want to follow you from today onwards. Is that okay? But we'll all pray it out loud together. 
So we're standing with these five, and maybe there's more. I haven't seen your hand. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, here I am. You know my sins. You know my heart. I want to follow you. I believe you died for me. And I believe you're alive again. Come into my life. Help me to believe. Help me to repent so that I will follow you today and every day of my life. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I do believe if you prayed that sincerely, God is saying the door's wide open. You're in. You're in. So please, before you leave, go to the welcome table, which is just by the tree in the courtyard, by the coffee, and chat with someone at the welcome table. Leave your name and say, I responded today, or I prayed today, or something like that. Father, I want to pray for us as believers that you would help us, Lord, not to turn aside to the right or to the left and compromise with sin, but you would help us focus on you and live for you. I pray for any who are caught in sin that you would release them from the snare. You'd set them loose and set them free. And I pray for us, Lord, that you would help us, each one of us in this church, to share the good news of Jesus with others, pointing them like John did toward you, that they might believe and through believing might have life. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, everyone. There's tea, there's coffee, there's lots of opportunities to make new friends. And don't forget, we'll see you next Sunday.